first item that we're going to talk about. First of all, thank you for coming. David Cummings, I'm your fourth board councilman. It's a pleasure to serve for this township and for to serve for you all in this community. And also want to thank the school superintendent, Dr. Pons, and the president and the principal of the school, Dr. Ms. Nami Kabara, for allowing us to use this space, which I think is very commendable. This is a community school, and we're having it for a community meeting. So I am very prompt, I'm very agenda-based, and I think, so what you see, if you got an agenda, we're going to follow it, and we're going to start with uh, the remediation of 399 Orange Road. If you're not familiar with 399 Orange Road, it is a piece of land on the corner of Orange Road, that might be Pleasant, Pleasant Avenue, Pleasant, 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 Pleasant Way, Way. Pleasant, Pleasant Way, as you come into town across from the Garden Center, on Orange Road. This is a piece of land that at one point was a gas station and there's been some that was discovered in the, in the property. Over time, there's been a lot of work done there and so the latest, I'm going to have Ms. Sonia Ward come up who works with H2M. They're the company that is responsible for the property in terms of remediation. So we were going to do a PowerPoint that she has given us in the past uh, Ms. Janice Talley will make sure that it's up on the website that you can see it. But I believe you've been doing this a while that you should be able to do this off the top of your head. So, Ms. Ward, can you come up, please? And this is our assistant, Jason. And she's going to give you a brief history, but also what their recommendation is and where we are now <coughs> with the piece of land. So Jason and I are going to tag team a little bit. I'm Sonia Ward. This is Jason Potosnack. We're with H2M Associates in Parsippany. And we've been working on this site since 2011. Um, the uh, site is known as the former South End Pyramid, South End Sitco Service Station. And it's been a, it was an active service station between 1986 and 2002. And it's been inactive since 2002 when the township acquired the property. And the property right now has been transitioned from a commercial use to a designated for future public use. So once all the cleanup's done, this will be public, used for public uh, use. I can't say that word too many times, can I? All right, so what we do when we do an investigation at a site like this one is that we have to identify the areas that we're concerned about based on the use of the property. And this one had a number of them, but it's not anything really unusual compared to what you would see at a normal service station with filling station and gas tanks and things like that. So, um, go ahead. Uh, the service station interior had floor drains in it and it had some uh, collection trenches in it and it had a hydraulic lift in it. And the pictures we have have that in that picture. Um, the hydraulic lift was removed in about 2004, and they excavated some soil there. So there's been some ongoing remediation as we've gone. Go ahead. Why don't you take on, take up from there, go on to the next one. I so think. specifically, we, as part of the investigation, you break up each area, as she mentioned earlier, based on what was there. So a section is gas tanks, section of the floor drains, sections of the collection trenches. So we have to investigate them, do collect samples around them to find if there's any contamination. If there is any contamination, we have to step out and kind of get a full delineated area of that area. Um, so floor drains, collection dredges were in the building previously, and we investigate each of those areas separately. And they drain to a collection drum, which was in the floor of the building. Right, which we didn't act actually find until after the building was torn down, I think in 2013. Mm -hmm. and on the property we found a drum buried that that's where all the oil and the different fluids went from the collection trenches and the uh, floor drains. And I want to say not many drums, one drum that was associated, it was connected to the collection trenches and the drains. So it was basically sitting right under the floor. Right. And since then, I mean, if you've, if you've seen it, it's just a empty plot of land with a fence around it. Um, and then with the floor, with that drum in 2017 we went out there we removed it and we removed soil from around it and collected samples to identify if there's anything remaining and kind of clean up any remaining whatever contents were inside that drum from the previous operations of the site. 
And one thing I want to say is that when we do this work, all this work has been done uh, since 2011 has been done using state money. So we go to the state, we ask them for funding to do the work that we believe needs to be done, we go out and do the work. So when we got to the part where we saw the oil collection drum in the floor, we were like, okay, we need to ask for money for remediation of that particular area because it was at surface, it was potentially open, so we wanted to make sure that people couldn't get, at, get into it, children couldn't fall into it, things like that. And when this is posted, there is a picture of it currently, which it just kind of shows where things were um, when it was operational. So it's just kind of a picture of the land as, as it is now with text saying where the tanks were, where the building was, and where the pump island was. And there were, um, when we went out there, we found, we have these historic maps that we use called Sanborn maps, and they're fire insurance maps. And on the maps, we found something that said that there might have been a gas tank in an area where we didn't know there was a gas tank before. They had already removed two tanks, but we were like, hmm, there looks like there might be some. So we did some surface testing for metal, looking for metal, and we found some metal. We found two more tanks. And so we asked for more money, and we removed those tanks. So to date, we have done soil vapor intrusion and groundwater investigations. So one of the things that we did, because we found contamination in soil, we have to find out if there's a groundwater impacts. And we found very minimal groundwater impacts on the property, and they're all on the property. They don't go off site. We installed three wells, and one of the things the state requires us to do is to delineate. Jason was talking about that earlier. We have to delineate vertically, and we have to delineate aerially. So groundwater, we have to go out, and we also had to drill a deeper well to make sure no contamination was going deeper, and it was not. That and, is a clean well. And part of that also is you install more than one well to identify which way groundwater is moving, mm -hmm. and that kind of shows us where it is in the ground to make sure we know what direction it's going and if it's going offsite or not, which yeah. in this case it's not. And it's go but it is flowing south. That's the direction it's flowing. Um, we have... Um, because we had soil and groundwater impacts, we re reviewed the data against vapor intrusion standards. So if you think about being at a gas tank, a gas station, and you're having your gas, your gas tank filled, you smell things in the air, and that's the volatile chemicals. So what volatile chemicals can do is it can move from inside the ground to a building. So we have to evaluate whether or not that is actually happening or potentially happening. And we did that. We reviewed the data against the results, the results we had against the standards, and there's no va a complete vapor intrusion pathway for buildings around the site. And obviously, we don't have a building on the site, and the future use is potentially a park, so that we don't anticipate any buildings on the site. The only areas that we still have to investigate are related to soil, and that's delineation. There are only three areas that require additional sampling. That is, we have a few more samples that we need to take in the area of the big old storage tanks. Wish I had these pictures. <laughs> uh, the ones that were previously removed. Um, then we have the oil collection trenches. We need to do a few samples to make sure that we know how deep some of the contamination goes. And then the floor drains as well. So that's all kind of where the building footprint was. If you remember, if you've driven by, know where the building was. In the presentation, we have a map of where the next borings we'll be going to collect samples from will be, just so you have an idea. Um, and they're just the ones that we need to collect to complete our delineation of each area of, con area of concern. Aren't they located near the sidewalk? Yes. Some of them are. Some of, one of them will be in the sidewalk. That's correct. Yes. So not near any of the houses? Not near the houses. All on site with the exception of the one on Orange Road, along Orange Road on the sidewalk. That's correct. Thank you, Janice. Okay, so I talked a little bit about funding. Um, so we recently received the funding from the New Jersey Economic Development Agency to cond conduct the additional soil sampling that we need to do. So we're going to be mobilizing to the site soon to do that additional investigation. And once we have that data, that information from um, from the laboratory, we send the samples to the laboratory. Once we have that information, we'll evaluate and we'll see how far it goes aerially and vertically. And that'll, that'll 
help us decide what needs to happen to remediate the site and then develop it as a park. So the most important thing we're looking at is protecting human health and the environment when we're doing this. So we must figure out where it is and then figure out how to keep people in, from coming in contact with it, whether that be through excavation or capping. Um, so once we get a work plan in place that combines both what needs to happen as far as remediation with the development of the park, then we'll request funding from the state to remediate that. And that's one of the things that uh, we don't have any control over, is how fast the state funds the project. Once the, pro once the um, property is um, developed, uh, excuse me, once the, the remediation is complete, we'll do a final report, and we'll have to do something called a response action outcome. And then the park will be developed, and the, the one thing that we do have to do afterwards is continue post-remediation monitoring. And the reason for that is because if, for example, we say we're going to put a cap on the surface, and it's a soil cap, and it's two feet thick, for example, if somebody goes out there and digs a two-foot hole, they're in contact with the soil. So every two years, you have to go out and inspect it and make sure it's right, and then if it's not right, you have to repair it. I think that's it. That was everything. And I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you. Are there, are there any questions? Sure. Mr. Scott. How many phases has that project gone through? Oh. <laughs> Janice, is it seven <laughs> or so? We're on our... our we're on grant number five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you think each grant is another phase, five, and when we're done with this and we go to remediation, that'll be six. Yeah. Over so. ten years. Ten years. Okay. Yeah. It's when you deal with state money, it takes time because we do that. They, they do the analysis. We submit the results. It takes six months to a year to get the response from NJDEP. Then we have to go back and prepare a grant application and ask for money. And that takes another six or six months to a year. So that's correct. It's a slow process, but it's at no expense to the township. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, and so, is it such that if we, we didn't sit around and wait for these grants and go on and on and spread it out for another ten years, that and the township decided that since it is township property, they go ahead and pay to have it remediated because it's been a blight for the community forever. Anyway, people are feeling as though it's interfering with them being able to get the maximum value for their properties and they're trying to sell it. Would that expedite the process? Because it seems to me that we're wasting, and we're not wasting, but there is a lot of time waiting, as Dana said, waiting to get state money and grant money and stuff like that. So if the township said today, it's our responsibility, yes, it's been a blight on the community for well over 10 years, we want to get this done. Um, would you expect then that it could move faster? It could definitely move faster if money was available to it today that, and there was no delay in funding from the state. So what would be the cost to have an estimate? What is the state supposed to be delivering to us? Well, they del the, the issue is that we have to tell them what we want to do. So, you know, if it's a $5,000, I'm just throwing that number out there. That's not a real number. If it's a $5,000 investigation, then we have to tell them it costs $5,000. They look at our work plan. I don't think it's ever cost. No, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't want to throw big numbers out. Uh, well, but if it, numbers. but we have to. It's I mean, really big numbers. Right. Is how much it's cost yeah. so far? Yes. Or across the state. Over the 10 years? Yes. It's 800000 Yeah. Approximately. Yes. So I think what, if I'm hearing what Doc is saying, if we were to get the cost of this, and we put the money up, would the state reimburse us? No, you have to get the funding approval first. That's, that's the gig. All right, yeah. so then we still need to figure out what it costs. So, Councilman, I guess that was part of the question, but the other part of the observation is that for over many years, we watched projects come and go all over Montclair, different areas of the township, went on and purchased and, and paid for them, and we watched them get done. And this project has been sitting there for anybody that lives near there. It is a blight. 
and it is interfering with their livelihood. So I guess I'm asking, please, that you at least consider that, sir, and begin well, that think, discussion yeah. and take a look at what other projects have been done, whether they're parks or whatever, that the township thought it was worthwhile for them to go ahead and pay for it and not have a community of people wait well over 10 years. They so came in about 10 years ago, but I think it was sitting before that by about 10 years, right? It's been like about 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's prior before the, before the township acquired it. Okay. But I get, I get the point, so that's a note well taken. Any other questions? I have a question. I know the area Hold is Hold on fed. a second. I'm oh, sorry. No. I just had a quick question. So does the state ever refuse to pay the monies for an ongoing project like we have? Should they cut you off? Not for the ongoing project. They've committed funding to this project. Oh. It gets a priority because it's been committed to in the past. I know the area is fenced. It, there used to be a sign on the fence. Did the no sign disappear? <laughs> Will so we need a sign to be put up to stay out. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. that's a good point. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. During the remediation process, I assume there's like a disturbance of the soil and whatnot. How is that process done so that when contaminants don't fly, whatever? Right. So, yes, we have to, when we're getting ready to do a remediation, we have to manage any kind of, uh, I think they call it fugitive dusts or uh, odors. And so we will, for example, if, we're, if it's a dusty day and, this, and the soil begins to fly in the air, we'll dampen the soil to keep it from moving. We also have the people who come in and remove the soil from the site in dump trucks, for example. We'll have them, um, you know, make sure that they don't track lots of soil into the road and make a big mess. Well, usually, um, because groundwater is not impacted um, heavily, and I know that there's a storm drain right at the corner, um, but groundwater is deeper than the storm drain. So I don't expect that that's happening, because the area that we are seeing soil impacts would be above the storm drain area. Okay. I want to thank you so much. I have a question. Oh. Yeah. Uh, who has to write up? <clears throat> who has to write up the grant proposal for um, to get additional funding? We do the technical part, and Janice really handles the rest of it. I do the submission. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate, you. Appreciate your attention. Next up, I want to bring uh, Commissioner Brendan Gill to give you guys an update on the uh, redistrict. Well, not redistrict district lines. For the congressional map, we had a call today <laughs> with the uh, congressional condition folks. You can come on up, Brent. And I will tell you that in the fourth ward, we have added four districts to the fourth ward. We've gone from four, well, if you know what your district is, four, one, four, two, four, three. We've gone from eight to 12. It's not, it, I would say that it's not a considerable increase in population. But it does give the township and to commissioners more congressional districts in Montclair. And so I want to give you an opportunity to explain. The map that you have, you probably can't really tell on it, but um, there were certain things we had to do because the original maps that were, that were approved about, what, a month ago? Or in January? We, there was some discussion about it, and we got them to throw out two maps that would have basically taken, if you look at the fourth ward coming down Harrison Avenue, it would have eliminated Sutherland, Howe, and Charles Street, and made them a part of the third ward. There was, and there was some discussion, flipped it out, and got back to what is still considered what was the original wards. And so what I want Brendan to give an opportunity to speak about is positive negatives to where we are right now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank Council for having me. First of all, good evening, everyone. It's great to, to see everyone. Um, I don't want to get in trouble because I almost probably could name every single person here. So it's great to be with so many friends uh, tonight. And uh, Councilman, your your better your better half was. Okay. 
your your better half was man in the door, and she remind she made a point to remind me to remind you that tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. So for her service tonight, she's expecting to be taken out tomorrow. So yeah, <laughs> for uh, for doing that um, for you. In, in addition, um, I just want to congratulate you and also in the tradition of uh, Dr. Baskerville, uh, who represented the Fourth Ward very ably during her time for continuing this tradition of community-based meetings. So thank you for continuing to do that uh, on behalf of all of us in the, you know, who, uh, who live here. Um, um, the, the re I'm happy to t talk a little bit about the redistricting. I also see there's actually quite a few things that have a county perspective, so I will stay as long as I, I can tonight. The Essex Hudson Greenway is something you know I'm very passionate about. Of course, the Glenfield Park uh, renovations has, is, is a county park. Um, you know, Lackawanna Plaza redevelopment abuts a, you know, a county, a county road. Um, you know, rent control is not controversial at all, so I'll leave that to, I'll leave that to you guys um, to handle. Um, and, and happy to also just give some general observations about turnout, um, you know, in the last uh, election, our, our Board of Education election, because I know there's just been some questions about what that actually means versus how many people are registered, et cetera. And just, just to give you my own personal take uh, and opinion uh, on that. Um, on the redistricting process, and, and again, I come to this um, as a county commissioner, I don't have a formal role in the process, and I appreciate that, Council, but I can give you some observation. I just think to level set the context, every 10 years, of course, on the census, the state has to redraw the congressional um, redistricting lines and the state legislative district lines. Uh, so, uh, you know, the congressional um, is a, uh, right now we have uh, 12 members um, of Congress, our state uh, representation is made up of 40 districts, so uh, each with one senator and two assembly uh, members each. Um, what's interesting about um, New Jersey is that we actually have, unlike other states, uh, a more apolitical process. Both the congressional redistricting lines and the state legislative redistricting lines are drawn by a commission, two separate commissions. Uh, five members each from each party who are appointed by party officials, and then each with an 11th member that's appointed by the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court. And what happens in both the congressional process and in the state legislative process is that if those, if the Republican, five Republicans and five Democrats cannot agree uh, to a map, that 11th member who's appointed again by our state Supreme Court Justice makes a choice and picks a map. In the congressional process this year, uh, actually what happened was um, shocking at the federal level. The uh, Republicans and Democrats couldn't agree um, on, a, on a map. So there was a Democratic map and a Republican map. Uh, and, the, and the 11th member chose uh, the Democratic submission. With the state legislative um, redistricting process, actually um, they took a vote. Uh, and there was a compromise map, a map that had the majority, the 10 members can vote, and there was a 7-3 vote, um, you know, that uh, one map had the support basically of three of the, uh, excuse me, uh, two of the um, Republicans and five of the Democrats. So it was, it was a, um, a compromise map. But it's actually very um, interesting because it's actually more of an apolitical process that happens in other states. In other states, this process usually just goes through the state legislature. So whatever party controls the legislature usually draws the lines and that kind of slows the process down for a, a long period of time. Once that process is set, we then get to the municipal process that comes through um, our county uh, board of elections. County board of election officials are actually appointees um, of the governor. Um, so there is a, a county board of elections uh, made up of an equal, again, an equal number of Republicans and an equal number of Democratic appointees. And their job is to draw the uh, municipal, the ward lines. Um, so as Councilman Cummings mentioned, um, there was a process for that where um, that has kind of transpired over the last month where we thought um, in Montclair that this, the submissions at least were not consistent with the past ward lines uh, as they uh, as they existed um, to add even more complexity to this process montclair is in a very unique position because we're one of the few communities in the state that based on the way the congressional lines were drawn that puts one town into two congressional districts so currently montclair is currently represented by congresswoman mikey sherrill and congressman um, donald payne uh, the, the, 
the, those two um, districts, um, not any one individual, but those two districts uh, have remained uh, under this new map. However, under the new map, uh, there is a greater portion of Montclair now in Congresswoman Cheryl's district uh, with essentially still, uh, by and large, you know, the fourth ward, is, as we know, a councilman in remaining in Congressman Payne's district. Um, I just wanted to give that context. I know before we got right to kind of what you wanted to address. So now what has to happen through this county process is that the municipality, uh, the municipality itself has to draw the individual election districts that exist within the ward. So we have the ward lines, which are now set. That's now a, a settled issue. And they're basically what they have historically been. Now within those wards, based on the increase in population uh, from our last census, we have to redraw uh, the district that you live in or, you know, so usually like if you live in, you know, fourth ward district one, we have to redraw what does district one look like? What does district two look like? And as a result, uh, Montclair now has six more election districts based on um, our increase in uh, of our population in the census. Uh, the first ward will have the same number of election districts. Uh, the second ward, I believe, will have one more election district. The third ward will have two more election districts, uh, and the fourth ward will go from eight to, uh, to 12. So they'll have four more election districts. Part of the reason for that is that, again, we have this increase um, in the census and in, the, in a general number of people who live in the, in the community, but also because Montclair is in two congressional districts, one of the things that is allowed for um, in under the law, which is, makes it increasingly complicated, is that an individual election district could be split between two congressional districts. So that means you and your neighbor could have two, you know, potentially across the street, could have two different members of Congress. And they're trying to make all these numbers work, to, you know, to, to be consistent, whatever the median number of people that needs to be in an, an individual district. So it's a, it's a, um, a very, um, complicated process to try to get to that number, which sometimes requires drawing of lines by people that have no, <laughs> to be very um, candid, have no sensitivity to the communities that they're drawing them, that they're drawing them in or about. Um, so pros and cons, the good news is um, that uh, our ward lines, I think, um, have remained consistent, which I think is good for continuity um, and, um, and allows us uh, you know, to move forward um, you know, around issues that it doesn't cause more confusion. You have, yeah. you, you have a, let's just say, there, let's just say hypothetically there was a park that was in one person's ward, then it moves to another under the new line. So it, one of the it, questions, go ahead, I'm sorry. Sure. One of the no, questions please. today on the call was that they need to make sure every ward counselor remained in their district. Mm -hmm. And meaning that because of the way these lines are sometimes drawn, I could have been in the third ward. And therefore, not in the fourth ward. So they so they re we reviewed that, and every ward counselor remains in their wards, and that will be finalized on Friday. Because today they went through Montclair and North, the last two communities that they had to go through this with. And I think to to come to the commissioner's point, it was it was one in which the original map that was drawn, um, we actually through. Uh, Paul Burr, who is our attorney Burr, interim attorney Burr, we went back and said, no, this isn't, this isn't acceptable. Because the way they redistricted it, it, the fourth ward at one point, who on the, the borderline of orange, as I was speaking before, was going to flip to the third ward. So Nishwain Road essentially became part of the third ward. And we, that means fourth ward would have lost all of that, those, those homes. Which would be confusing because then all of a sudden people don't know where to go vote. And so right now, what they're trying to figure out, they want to make sure in this redistricting that they don't oversaturate certain polling places. So they don't want it to be where, like this initial lane, they now take third ward and fourth ward voters. Can it handle that? If they can't, they may need to open up another polling place. So it is, as much as the process right now and the lines are finished, like everything, there are unintended consequences. So the next thing is to make sure that when people go to vote, they know where to vote, and when they do go to vote, that both that polling place can handle the body. 
Oh no, you don't want to finish. And I'll sum up, and I'll have it. So I couldn't agree more. So that, so from a, um, a, a process standpoint, where the County Board of Elections is, they're still ratifying the maps uh, that will be have our ward and district lots. So that's kind of where we are in the process right now. I think the, the, the councilman is spot on about what, what you know, locally, uh, what the concern has been and, and has been expressed. Uh, to the county board of elections, uh, and I think we're in a better place in terms of where, the, in terms of our ward lines, and as a, and as a practical matter, the district lines and in, in increase in districts is actually um, a good thing for the for the township uh, because, and it's not a partisan matter, but uh, both the Republicans and Democrats um, have local party committees, and those local party committees have representatives based on how many. Uh, districts that you have. So for us to go from 35 districts, which we now have, uh, to uh, 40, to, I think we've said it more, 40, so 42, uh, 42 districts, that means each of those local party committees will now have an opportunity uh, to increase their own number of representatives, uh, which is helpful uh, for Montclair, quite frankly, um, you know, in the larger kind of context to be able just to have more representation. So, you know, so, so I think, you know, um, the, the, the council, the township attorney and, and team was, was, was very much on top of this. So, you know, and making sure that um, uh, Montclair, um, you know, was uh, well represented, in, you know, throughout, throughout this process. I have no, I should have said that front, as I'm a county, that normal wrinkle, I'm an elected county commissioner, but I have no well, you are doing it, right. I'm not a redistricting expert, so I'll try to answer any questions I can, but I'm not a redistricting expert by, by, uh, by any stretch. I'll, I'm happy to take, yeah. to take questions. And what I will say, based on, if you think about it, I think the fact that, Mount, that the fourth ward went from 8 to 12 is a representative of where people are moving to in the township. So to me, that says, that says other things, but it is something that we all, I do want to make sure that we recognize. Um, Doc, do you have your hand up first? I think Oh, um, yeah, I just I really don't understand what districts are all about. I understand wards, no problem, but what is the point of the district other than to help the two party, um, you know, parties? <laughs> you know, I, I really, I mean, you see, you get a, yeah. your ballot where you're supposed to vote for someone right. to represent your district. You know nothing about those people unless you're involved in politics. But if you're not, it's like, you know, what is all this about? Is there a, so the district. I mean, so the districts are the. I mean, the districts are historically just the subdivision of right of, of being able to organize a group of people um, to be able to vote in one location, right? Right. So it's a. It's a. Um, and it's under, I believe, a state state statute um, that the municipalities and counties have to um, have to carve up their voting population by ward. And district, an election district. Like the, the, the election district is base is, is uh, the building block, the you know the most basic building block of how you organize a group of a group of voters. The the second part in terms of like what is your district representative or what does that individual do or that, that's a whole I agree that's a separate conversation. But the 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 party the uh, not not just them but it's the party the major two party committees. They use under their own by they they're separate. They have their own set of bylaws. They use the election district as the building block for local representation within their yeah, within, the of voters within their yeah within their like within their organizations. But I I, I think the answer for, I do, I think it comes from the I think the statute itself um, requires uh, requires that to be you know as a as a logical thing as like how you would know where you know if I live here where do I go and where do I go in the yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so I, um, I'm, I'm extremely concerned, and I'd like to, um, if you can answer this, sure. Commissioner sure. or Councilman, I'm very concerned about the uh, congressional district, and, and, and I'm very concerned for a lot of reasons, and it's hard sitting here, so I'm going to just stand up, because as a, um, um, Mr. Gill explained to us originally, the 11th congressional district was a very small portion of Montclair, NJ11. It was in mostly Ward 1 in the um, northern end of Montclair, very small portion. 
And then overnight, when they did this redistricting, all of a sudden, it's a huge, huge chunk. The majority now is in the 11th in the township. And for whatever that reason is, and I'm concerned, and perhaps you can tell us, I can't figure out why they decided to leave a very small slither of the 10th congressional district that's mostly south end. No longer, I don't know the um, demographics per se at this particular time, but historically it was black and it was low and moderate socioeconomic. You know, thank God now we're becoming more blended neighborhoods and all kinds of people are there. But it really concerns me, and I'd like to have somebody explain so I don't believe this anymore, that the thought was, we want Mikey in, we want Mikey in at any cost, and these people over here in the fourth ward are dispensable. And I'm going to tell you why I say that. I say that that was a thinking because at this point in time, in terms of congressional races, the people that remain in the 10th will be dispensable. As um, the commissioner mentioned, we have local committees. Right now, one of the local committees is focusing all of their attention and all of the resources on one candidate, and it's not the candidates that are in the 10th Congressional District. And then every now and then they throw out, well, here's something for the candidates in the 10th. So that means that we are dispensable. Whether we vote or not, they've done the math and they figure out that with this many votes, we can get Mikey Sherrill in, and the rest doesn't matter. The same on the other end with the tent. With the number of people that are left in the tent, if you do the math, the people that are running for there, they can win or lose without us. And I really feel like what it does is disenfranchise people who have historically led the votes in Mont. The commissioner knows this, him and, and his family have been at this for decades. Historically, the fourth ward has led the votes in the township of Montclair. And we've said, you know, where the fourth ward goes, there goes others. If you look even now with just a very short turnover we've had, you see that the last vote, we were next to the lowest number of vote turnouts in this, this most recent vote. And I believe that people are already disenfranchised. I believe that other people are looking at that and feeling as though perhaps they're disenfranchised because the votes won't matter, because the majority of people in certain committees are just focusing on one candidate. And I want to know, you know, how this happened? How did it come about? The, when they divided the land, it doesn't go like, here's, you know, 10th up here, let's cut it in half, and this will be 10th and 11th. They went, okay, let's dig through here, let's pull out the fourth board here, let's circle around, and come out. You guys saw the map. And in order to do that, there, there had to be strategic moves that were done. And, and to me, and I'm hoping that I'm wrong, but to me, it really looks as though it was class and race driven. And to somebody that really loves this township as much as you guys, maybe more, and believes in what we're trying to accomplish here, I find it offensive and I think it's hurtful. So I want to hear somebody tell me, no, that's not what happened. No, everything that you said is totally not accurate. It just happened this way. And, and explain to me what that thought was when they went through that to, to come up with this um, thing, because it just doesn't appear as though it's, this happened by coincidence. So, I'll, do you want to take that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a question, it was really an explanation of well, I need, I need I'm, help saying, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying, it's really an explanation of what has transpired. Essentially, the fourth ward has part of pain, and it's, he's always won where now it seems a majority of the town is going to Mikey Sherrill, and we all know that Mikey probably had a, has a tougher race. So the appearance, and I say appearance, is that this was done to support her. Is that a, that's, that's the question at hand. So I think this is probably something you can uh, touch on, but I don't know if we can give the exact reason, because we didn't read the district. Right, right. So, so I think it's so I think two two things, and and I definitely appreciate that. Here, you, Dr. Basquiat. You know, we we talked about it, and so and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it in this forum. Um, so, so districts are not drawn for people, right? So it's not Payne's district and Cheryl's district, right? right? There are two there are two congressional districts, and although Payne's district has historically gone Democratic, it could go. It, <laughs> Theoretically, it also could go Republican. So we have to start there that these districts are not supposed to be drawn for individual um, members of, of, of Congress. 
um, as I explained to you, and, and uh, as, as they said in Hamilton, like I wasn't in the room where it happened. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you um, my opinion on what, what I believe um, happened in, in talking to leaders. Uh, of course, this, this is a nonpartisan event, but I'm going to give you a perspective of someone who was on the Democratic Party side of um, this process. The map that was submitted um, by the, the Democrats that were the, the Democratic map um, was a map that was endorsed by all of the incumbent Democratic members of Congress. So what that means is that Congressman Payne, who was very clear, again, this is just this is the partisan part of this, Congressman Payne, who was very clear that he wanted to make sure he maintained representing Montclair, also decided that, um, as I know in iterations of these maps, as it was told to me, that he was willing to um, allow, if there was a map that put more of Montclair into another congressional district, to make that congressional district more um, competitive or give the Democrats a chance to win two seats instead of one, he was willing um, to make that um, sacrifice uh, with the longer term goal. Again, this is, and I know we're not here for partisan politics, but or the longer term goal of giving the Democratic Party the best chance they can to have a Democratic um, Speaker of the House um, after the 2022 elections um, are, are completed. So on, on, the, on the base of it, where it may look like one piece of the community was put in a district versus the other, those decisions were made um, by that commission with all of the people who represent Montclair um, on the federal level in the room. So I will add to that. When this first happened, I reached out to Congressman Payne and asked him if he was okay with this and if he wanted something to be done because it seemed to me he was losing a great piece of chunk of land in Montclair. And his response was similar to what the commissioner said and that this is not about me as much as it is about the greater party. And I am willing, but I would like to keep the fourth ward. That's what he said to me. And so at that point, I then followed what he said. And I was like, okay, you're good with this. Then it seems like this is something that is outside of making it more than what it could have been. But it's not his call. And see, my problem is we're, we're belittling this issue. And the issue is much larger. It's a civil rights matter. And I think that people that have legal minds here, people that have thoughtful minds here, understand what I'm saying. It's not Congressman Payne's call to make whether he wants just the fourth ward or whether he doesn't whether Mikey wants all of them there, whether he doesn't. Somebody, whoever the gatekeeper is for us, should have been watching at that door and the same moves that we did with our attorney here, and I thank you so very much for the role that you played with the ward. Where, where was the gatekeepers when we did the congressional districts? Because if we had legal representation in there, I'm sure they would have looked at that. And they would have looked at the fact that if we wanted to do fair, we're not sitting here picking candidates. We shouldn't be doing that. I mean, I know people do it, but I don't want us in Montclair to just do that and think it's okay, because it's not okay. They should have gone north, south, east, west, half and half, something that makes sense in my mind. Don't come in and start drawing around so that Ward 3 is out, and then we're going to come and slither back through here and literally look at the socioeconomic pattern that they drew into to say, this is what pain. I don't, I'm, I'm not, you know, I love, both uh, Mikey Sherrill and Don Payne Jr. I've known Don Payne Jr. forever. It's not about, you know, who your buddy is. This is about legal rights in terms of, and civil rights in terms of drawing congressional districts. And if this were happening in Atlanta, if this were happening anywhere in the South, everybody in this room would be in an uproar and fighting them because we know what this does. But because it's us, we're willing to turn a blind eye. We read all kinds of things in the newspaper about people running, talking about, well, we need a black district. Okay, well, I mean, to me, is, is that legal? You know, first thing I want to know is, is this legal? Now we can make districts and district lines based on we need a black one or we need a white one or this one. I want to know what is legal and what is within the law and are we violating that and putting smoke screens over that because we don't really want to look at ourselves and as a pediatrician, I get up every morning and I use our children as my compass and I just don't feel good about this and I want to know why we didn't bring in a legal individual to take a look at this and to represent us here when we did the congressional one. Okay, so um, uh, you got a question? Uh, yeah, I'm 
not as concerned and understand the partisanship aspect of this. I was going to relatedly ask you what was your opinion whether or not you felt it was more important to have two congressional districts within the uh, town or one? Do you believe we gain from having, uh, how, whatever size it is, having a piece with uh, Donald, with the 10th and a piece with the 11th, or would we be stronger in terms of representing Montclair's interest with just one district? That's what I, I, I I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't want to focus on Renee's particular aspect. I get you. So I want to, first of all, Doc, I hear you. And there's something that we'll talk about um, just to see what happened, because um, I want to make sure that you understand that. Now to, um, Martin. Martin, I, I can't believe I forgot your name. So Martin's <laughs> question, I think, I think that's a pretty straightforward one for you. To my, 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 I appreciate my personal opinion is that um, we do better to have two members of Congress. I mean, if you can have two members that represent one community um, and be able to that work collaboratively on issues that affect our community, I think, you know, I think we do very well having uh, having having two members of Congress, and and. Uh, Dr. Bashkill, to your point, I just I, I do want to say I, I can say that in the in the in the um, in the redistricting process again, there um, um, to a certain extent, our congressional rep, our congressional representative, the lawyers that represent the party, those are the people that are in, I, guess, I think that are in in the room, and we're happy to share even with the group. And this is a a process that over the course of time, you know, even for someone like me who's been in politics for a long time, that it's. To get educated in it, and 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 it's an extremely important, you know, for for sure. Um, it's actually where you know a lot of our leaders have now spent a lot of time. If you know former former President Obama and Eric Holder, our former U.S. you know our former Attorney General, actually after they left the office, they started a you know a nonprofit campaign to try to educate people in this country about how this particular process. Uh, in different states works and why it's important to be paying attention to all these to all these yeah, issues I, so I think with Doc's question is we want to know who was in the room like it's so I mean I, that, I could, that's, yeah that's, that's, that's the that, question yeah that's it I mean that's it I already know who's exactly yeah. in the room yeah. I agree okay. of course we need to have two representatives if we can get them but we could have had the third and the fourth or the second mm -hmm. and the third whatever and still got two congressional I just want to know why it appears to be driven by race and class and not by anything else. It doesn't appear to be driven by need two, because we could have had two. We had two before. Are Understood. there any other questions? Okay, okay. No, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'll, 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 uh, if you know, you've heard about the Essex Hudson Greenway. That's going to, well, where she's here to give an update of what his status is. At one point, it was like, oh, it's all in. Then it was a question about the funding. Um, but I think the group has kind of made some headway. And the reason I brought Deb here is funny. We talk about redistricting. At one point, this wouldn't be in the fourth ward based on the original line that was, that was driven, that was written up. Um, but then, based on what we sent back, uh, the area where the Essex Hudson will now end in Montclair is back in the fourth fourth. But so that's why I asked Dad to come by and just give you guys a brief understanding. Is everyone somewhat familiar with the Essex Hudson Greenway? Yes. Okay, I'll explain to you. Where does they start? Where's the ending? Just turn right Ending is over the mountain side, no, where no, the no. Glen Ridge mountain side. Um, yeah, it's in that area. Yeah. Sherman and Bay in, in that area behind the hospital is so the general area. To answer the young lady's question real quick before you start, Essex Hudson Greenway basically has become a pathway, bike walk pathway from Glen Ridge Montclair border to Jersey City, where you can literally walk and bike and all the way there without a train, without anything other than outdoors and what you like to do. So that's, that's essentially what it can become. Dad? So thank first, you. thank you. Uh, Councilman Cummings for having me here to talk about the project um, and as uh, Commissioner Gill said there are a number of people here 
in this group that have been very supportive of the project. So I just want to do a quick shout out to all of you. Thank you very much for all the support, Dr. Beth for your support um, all along, uh, Carmel, for Janice, for, of course, uh, a big shout out to our Commissioner Gill, who has been unrelenting uh, champion for this project. Uh, and I will say, having been behind the scenes a little bit uh, in the last year and a half especially, uh, this would not have happened without him. Uh, he has been pivotal in the success we've had this year. Um, and we're very lucky to have him here in Montclair and as our commissioner for the county. And to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so very, very quickly, um, as uh, Councilman Cummings said, this is an 8.6 mile uh, greenway, proposed greenway along the old Booton line. It uh, terminates or the gateway, depending on which way you're coming, uh, either in Montclair and Jersey City. So um, there is, uh, will be either the terminus or the gateway, uh, will be in uh, part of the fourth ward. Um, and so I think it's very important, of course, that uh, you are all updated on, on what's happening. This greenway will bring about 135 acres of new green space uh, into the region and a whole uh, myriad of benefits in general to the region that range from space for uh, personal um, health and exercise and mental health to environmental health to active transportation options to bringing in new economic development uh, to our communities uh, along with environmental um, benefits and sustainability. So really a transformational project for the region. Um, I won't go into all of that. I've given a couple of slideshows um, in the past year uh, for the fourth ward. So I'm just going to sort of catch you up uh, a little bit in the last period since I last presented uh, to the fourth ward. In the last year, uh, we did do a very heavy advocacy campaign. Um, I'm the executive director of the New Jersey Bike and Walk Coalition. We are one of the main partners in the Essex Hudson Greenway project. And we led the community outreach and engagement part uh, in particularly over since 2014, but particularly in the last year and a half, we have done a lot of this outreach and, and presentations. So I have lots of material if anybody wants to talk further um, offline. I'm happy to go into more detail about the project. In the last period, um, the most exciting thing, of course, that happened is in November, in early November, uh, after all of this advocacy, which included uh, 137 organizations have uh, signed on to support the project. Over 8,000 letters were sent to the governor uh, in support of this project, along with numerous resolutions. And again, uh, thank you to the council of Montclair uh, that passed uh, a resolution and to the county, which also passed a resolution. <laughs> November saw uh, the governor uh, make an announcement that the state of New Jersey will purchase uh, the right-of-way for the entire quarter intact for $65 million. Um, that announcement was made in November, um, and during that time he referred to this quarter as going to be the jewel in the New Jersey State Park system. So we were very excited uh, to hear that. Currently what's happening um, in 2020, just go back a second, in 2020 uh, there was a purchase and sale agreement uh, between the Open Space Institute, which is the land trust that is doing the transaction and negotiating with the owner, which is Norfolk Southern Railroad. Um, that purchase and sale agreement was for a government entity to buy and take control and development of this Greenway corridor, and that <coughs> agreement terminated at the end of January in 22. So all of our advocacy, as those of you who know, was really targeted to getting the state to take on ownership of this by that date, which was accomplished. Um, as you can imagine, a transaction that includes eight towns, two counties, for a national utility railroad is extraordinarily, extraordinarily complicated. Uh, there's environmental, there's legal, there's engineering surveys, there's political issues, there's many things that have to be taken into account. 
So um, the Open Space Institute, uh, the state of New Jersey, and Norfolk Southern together negotiated an extension to the current purchase and sale agreement to June 30th. So that's great news for us because it allows us this time to do all of that legal work. Um, and that's what the state is focused on right now. So I know there's lots of questions. I've been in many meetings in community engagement. People want to know when it's going to start and what's going to happen and who's going to be able to make decisions. And I can say at this point that the focus is really on completing right now the transaction. And once that transaction is completed, we will start to have a better idea also of how the state is going to look towards organizing and managing the development of this quarter. So a lot of questions you have, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. A lot of questions you have I may not be able to answer now, um, but of course I'm more than happy to hear them. Uh, I want people to understand this is the beginning process for community engagement and that particularly once we have a closed uh, transaction, uh, the New Jersey Bike and Walk Coalition, along with the other partners, will begin to pivot more towards uh, that kind of input. You should know that no decisions have been made on design or planning yet. So community and your input is at the very beginning of this process. Um, and we want to hear from you. We will be developing meetings and, and ways for that input uh, to be incorporated and for the state and whatever management organizations are developed to hear that input. Um, so if I cannot answer your questions tonight, I probably will not be able to because I know some what some of them are. Understand that we are here to hear those questions, to um, relay those questions to those people that will be making some of those decisions and to develop uh, the communication and the systems to continue the input throughout the entire process. So, and I want to yep. thank you, and one of the things I think, <laughs> as we move forward, and Deb knows where I stand, it's very important to me that the neighborhood where that will be most impacted is involved in the design and development, because yeah. I think that's where streets, roads may have some changes, and so that's where I've been from the beginning, and I, that's where I will always end, because when you do things like this, my concern has always been what the individuals are going to be most impacted. How's that? What are their feelings? Because it's easy for me to walk in and walk out. I don't live there. So I think the project on the surface has been welcomed and is considered to be something that's positive. I do have some reservations, but I think as we move forward, um, Deb is committed to always come and be here to kind of be a part of that. So whatever I can do to help you make sure that the folks are aware of it, I will. Um, are there any questions about this? Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, at any point, do you think that the towns along the way would be responsible for any maintenance or any costs down the road? And would that be shared equally or some other way that's based on uh, It's a good question, and again, I don't know the answer, but I will tell you this, that uh, the ownership of the property will be with the state, um, and the state will, of course, be need to work with all the towns. Uh, the, the monies to develop it have not been raised yet. We're talking about a commitment from the state to buy the property, so we still have a long way to go. Uh, a lot of those conversations with the municipalities and the counties will have to take place as soon as the transaction has been completed. And one other question. Sorry. Unless you have any further I, I input would, on that. No, I would just say I think the, the counties, I, I think Essex in its conversation that, had, that I don't think has happened with Hudson yet, but um, indications are that the, the administration, uh, the county administration would um, uh, absolutely be open to, you know, maintenance and other things of that nature. So I think, I think the, again, the idea with this project is not to strap the municipalities with more things, right, to have to cover and take care of, and it's really a, a state, regional, or county project. So, um, you know, I think 
I think I know I'll be a strong voice to encourage the county to assume some of those responsibilities. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, I talked to Mayor Bloomfield from Glen Ridge, and they both support it, mm -hmm. but they've also made it clear that to your question, ultimately, once you start to develop what will be that role, and I think to Dev's point, we haven't gotten to that yet. Yeah. And so, but I'm sorry, I knew you had another question. Yeah. And it was just going to be just the opposite side of that question, right? So the state is playing a significant role. So the administration, if it isn't uh, the administration, the administration can come in and do, you know, to unfortunately do a Chris Christie and pull the rug, right? I mean, is that entirely possible too? Uh, they've committed to, to buy the corridor and to create it as part of the, uh, the state park system. Exactly how that will happen. Yeah has not happened. I, I, I do not, no, no one has referred to this as a project of an individual administration. If that's your, is that what you're that's getting at? Once the, I'm sorry, once the land transaction is completed, it would be, incre I mean, it would be incredibly difficult um, after the state invested $65 million for the purchase to for another, you know, could always. I mean, anything yeah, well, could. You know, anything bad. Same should, thing about the we, we saw what happened with the tunnel, so that. So I don't want to say it never could happen, but right. um, that's why we were excited about that investment because if we think it puts us um, so one step closer, and you know. So, so you, you mentioned Hudson. Do we know where Hudson stands right now? Dave. On are you talking about on maintenance or in, ge in general? Yes, in the, on the project itself. Hudson has been um, from the beginning. A, a big, big supporter of this. Um, uh, uh, Mayor Fulop and Mayor um, uh, Baraka from Newark did a, uh, a joint uh, editorial along with uh, Commissioner Gill. Um, the executive from Hudson came on very early in support of this. And in fact, it was an earlier version of a financing um, plan that he was all for. So he's been, they've been on board as well as the planning, uh, head of planning for Hudson County. So they've been big supporters. Thank you, Dad. Sure. Thank you all again for your support. No, it's actually for you. Okay. I, mean, I think you're making a great point, David, about um, the local neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Because if you think of uh, the Sherman Street area being the, like, the gateway of the terminus of this, where are the people going to park? when they come from out of town to use this. I or think it's, it's really walking and biking. Well, but yes, yeah. but to your point, right. there will right. be, for, and, I, and again, Deb knows where I am, yeah. and it's, she knows that I've made it very clear that the, the, yeah. the yeah. residents will be having a chance to ask those questions, which then will flip to the township, well, regard, I because we are in the yeah. Well, it's it's not an it's not a a, a, a question that hasn't been raised before. Yeah, sure. Janice is uh, uh, very aware of this, and you're right. There will be um, some new, you know, parking and cars and people coming. And one of the things I know that is part of the conversation, and again, nothing has been decided, but that the hospital, whose parking uh, um, space is right near the quarter, is very interested in being a partner in developing this um, going forward. So they'll be part of the conversation as well and will bring in resources and they've already incorporated that as a question in their ongoing uh, development plan. So it's a good question, but I think we have some partners with the hospital on it. Thank you, Dad. Sure. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next two items I can knock out the park, I think fairly simple, really three. Um, we approved last night the funding for, well, to send out the bid, the funding to renovate Essex and Nishawang Park. So they will be completely renovated uh, this spring and summer. I would not be able to say that this is something that this council has done. This was money that was approved for Dr. Baskerville and previous council. So they had a plan of doing all the parks, which they did, and unfortunately COVID delayed this from happening at the end of their tenure, but I will say that this is something we do owe the previous council for supporting and getting done. All we had to do was say yes to money that was already there. So this would be great. The parks will be uh, basically at Nishawang, walk pad, new basketball court, new tennis court, new benches. <coughs> the only request I have is the benches that were benches up in the um, northern part of that are the paintings and things around them that they remain because they're really artistic, and then everything else will be done. 
the pool will not get anything done to it, and the, the playground area will not. Pool primarily because we are using Green Acres funds for this, and we use Green Acres funds. If you you hope that then all of a sudden we would not be able to limit the pool to being to Montclair residents only. So there's nothing that that's going to come on the township to get to Nishimwe Pool. But I'm excited about these two things at Essex getting that area fixed as well. So as many people don't realize Essex is in the fourth ward, um, but it is, and this is a great thing. So we'll have two parks that'll be taken care of. And there also is work done on Canterbury, where Canterbury's actually, their playground will be upgraded. So, you know, essentially we're getting our parks really to take care of. Um, Mr. Gill brought up, thank you, honey. I know you like that. <laughs> 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 Since we moved here, that's been her pet peeve. Um, what I would say about Glenfield, and this is something I think is very important, is the county, thank you, Commissioner Gill, Joe D, they have basically decided they were going to come in and we're going to have a new Bali Choice Community Center. And what and then there's plans to do the football field and turf it potentially with lights and really make it a very huge area. However, and this is where uh, I appreciate being able to have conversations with the county because the original plan for the Wally Choice Center was to have it closer to Maple Lab. And one of the things, again, that I've always strived with, what the residents of Maple Lab feel about that? And it was concerned that the location would block their view into the park. Through that conversation, Joe then found a way of, pull, of putting the park further back Better access, more parking. So it's not a, their obstruction is not there anymore to see the field. The next conversation that Joe and I have, and I say Joe, Mr. Salvanti, Mr. DiVincento, is I got to talk to the residents about the field. There's huge support from our recreation programs to have that field done because they are, they, we do not in township have enough fields for our, of all of our recreation programs. However, I go back to residents. If you put a lighted field in Glenfield Park with turf, there is going to be activity there on a consistent basis. And again, you come, you play, you leave. The residents remain. They're the ones who have to deal with the parking, the noise, and the garbage. So that is a conversation to be had. I do think there are some things that the township can do with the Board of Ed to increase or improve their fields and the townships to open up some things. There have been some quiet discussions with the Recreation Department and the Townships and the, and the Board of Education's facilities about that, and we'll just need to see. But I just want to make sure that people know that the next conversation I'll be having is with residents of Woodland, Wheeler Street, Woodland Avenue, uh, Willowdale, anything abutting Glenfield, to make sure that they understand what is coming and what the potential is so that we can hear from them. So that's kind of like where Glenfield is right now, and I think, um, I saved the best two items for last um, because these are the two that potentially, um, one most definitely will have a huge impact on us. That's the last item. But next, I want to bring up David Placent and the developer for the Lackawanna Plaza project that has been going on forever. Um, I think that's the, I say that respectfully. Um, I know David has been having a lot of conversations with multiple people, and again, I cannot have this meeting without Lackawanna Plaza being discussed. I will tell you from the township side, as a member of the Finance Committee, we are in the process of going through some things with Mr. Placic financially to work out some things, but I think in terms of what his vision is for the project and those things that um, I believe he's okay with discussing, and so that's why I'm gracious. I'm very happy that he's come to give you guys, similar to what Deb did, an update on where we are at this moment. So, David, however you want. Yeah, no, thanks, Councilman. Uh, Commissioner Gill, you said you would take this one, so I'll invite <laughs> you back up. Uh, we're bordered by two county roads, so you can answer the tough questions. Uh, no, thank you, Councilman. I appreciate it. It has been a long process. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I know a lot of faces in the audience. Uh, David Plasek, Montclair resident. Uh, my family and I have been here for about eight and a half years now. 
acquired Lackawanna Plaza just over a year ago. So it has been a long, drawn out, you know, controversial project. Uh, we stepped in just over a year ago and really have no intention to build the plan that had been talked about since 2017 um, and earlier versions. We've been spending the last year working very hard uh, with members of the community. I know I've had discussions with many people in this room about the site and what the site means to them um, and what they want to see come out of Lackawanna Plaza in its newest iteration. Um, we're still continuing through that process. Uh, we look forward to really diving into the details of our vision probably in the coming month or two and can really share a lot more details then. I can tell you that the priority since day one, and I've said this since day one, is to get a grocery store into Lackawanna Plaza that'll be a viable grocery store that's not going to go out of business in five years or ten years and is really a grocery store that meets the needs of the community. And I think that's very important because grocery stores are not all the same today like they were in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, back then they had different names on the front door, but they all carried the same product. Uh, and then we've seen a paradigm shift since the 90s into the 2000s where grocery stores really tried to differentiate themselves. You remember the first thing we got were those, you know, loyalty cards that you put on your keychain and you had to scan. That was their way of creating loyalty from all the consumers. And all of a sudden, you wanted to shop at this grocery store versus this grocery store to get your points. And there was a lot of psychology behind that. Then they started coming up with their own private labels, right? And you wanted to buy that brand over this brand because it was more cost effective and it tasted better. Uh, and then the smaller grocery store concepts came in that were specialty markets. Uh, we saw the organic market start to evolve. And then we saw the introduction of the completely private label market like the Aldi's and Lidl's and some of the other ones that are out there. So, We've spent a lot of time talking to people in the community and trying to understand what they're looking for with regards to a grocer, what the real need is that we're looking to meet with that grocery store. And it came down to a grocer that was, you know, a good sized grocer, not a small grocer, a grocer that provided brand names. Certainly it's going to have its own private label. Everybody does these days, but you know, I love Ruffles, sour cream and cheddar chips, <laughs> right? And I can't get those at Whole Foods. I can't get those down the road at Aldi. Uh, and my daughter now loves them and my son now loves them and I need to buy a really big bag of those chips. I want a grocery store where I can go buy Ruffles brand names or Doritos or Coke and Pepsi side by side. So we are working to bring that type of a grocery store to Lackawanna, one that has the brand names that we've all known and loved. Uh, a sizable grocery store. I will say that the grocer that we're looking to bring in here will be the largest grocery store within Montclair Township. Uh, it's not going to be a big 80,000 square foot supermarket. Uh, it'll be probably half that size, which is still comparable in size to uh, the Whole Foods in West Orange. Uh, I think that's a 43,000 square foot grocery store. It'll be roughly that size. So a, a big sized grocery store, not a smaller market or anything along those lines. Um, and look forward to making, you know, an announcement about that again in the coming month or so. Uh, hopefully, you know, in April we can present some news uh, more definitively and provide more details on what that is. And in addition to that, really providing community space. Um, you know, one of the fundamentals of BDP Holdings, my firm, and why I created it was doing development a little bit differently. And you'll hear me talk time and time again about the three pillars of sustainability. And that's really rooted in my personal ethos, my family's ethos, and what that means is not just environmental sustainability, which is what we think of, but sustainability as a whole only functions if you've got these three pillars holding it up. And environmental sustainability is a core. That's one of those three pillars. In addition to that, social equity. Uh, what do I mean by social equity? Um, that's really creating space for everybody. You don't have to pay admission to come experience things at Lackawanna. That's incorporating affordable housing and workforce housing. That's creating community spaces. That's creating other initiatives that are driven by and for the community. That's having open space that's truly open and free, that you don't have to buy anything to go experience it and sit in it. Um, in addition to that, the remaining pillar and one of the you know, keys of any project is economic vitality. We want to develop something 
that isn't going to be vacant in 15 years. Lackawanna Plaza, the iteration that you see today that's been sitting vacant for the last six years, was built in 1986. And the economic vitality of that center really started to decline about 14 years later, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Those of you who lived here then certainly saw the stores change over, spaces go vacant, and everything else. We don't want to create a new development that's going to end up in that same situation. We want to create something that has real viability, vitality. You don't want to have me or somebody else talking to you 15 years now you know, about having to revision it again. So a lot of great things have been in the works. I've certainly heard from a lot of you about, you know, asking the question, what's happening? I drive by there and nothing's happening. Uh, and I can relate. I drive by it too, probably seven times, eight times a day. Jason Gleason can attest to it because I wave to him as I drive past his office every time. There's a lot happening behind the scenes. Um, development, Redevelopment is a very, you know, detail-focused process. There are a lot of architects and engineers and other professionals involved. Uh, we are very proud to have eight Montclair residents as a part of our design team, uh, current residents and former residents. So it's really a project that's being designed for Montclair by people from Montclair. Uh, and we are very, very proud of that fact. One of our architects, a uh, man by the name of Roger Smith, he's a principal with Gensler, was the architect, lead architect in Newark for the Community Museum of Social Justice. When I first spoke with him, we had a phone call. The only thing we talked about, he saw the, you know, the community meeting we did in March, and he said, hey, I watched this meeting. You mentioned social equity. Tell me what you mean by that. And we had a phone conversation for about an hour talking about nothing other than that. Then we met and we just started, you know, really hitting it off and evolving the conversation. And I know he was, you know, one of the right people to lead the charge on this project. So very excited about the direction it's going in. Um, look forward to, you know, hopefully being invited back if you do this again next month and sharing an update, uh, more details, more progress. Um, but are looking forward to continuing the dialogue with the township and the rest of you. I'm going to cut out right after this because my seven-year-old turns eight at midnight. And I want to say good night to him on his last day of a seven-year-old. He tells me he's the most Irish of all of us because he was born on St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'm going to leave a stack of cards at the front table, though. Um, I'm happy to field any questions now. But anybody who doesn't have an opportunity to ask a question, by all means, take a card, give me a call, or shoot me an email. Um, happy to uh, meet one-on-one -on -one or have a conversation with anybody about, uh, you know, any of their thoughts, comments well, about gonna, the project. Thank you. We're going to give some questions, but I want to I say one thing about David that I thought from a personal level that was so good to me. Uh, about three months ago, he reached out to me and said, hey, we're looking for someone to lead us on a PR to kind of roll out what we want to do. And I'd like to get a minority firm. Can you give me some list of minority firms? And for me, I will tell you, one of the things that I'm committed to is getting opportunities for minorities from the township. And so when he did that, I just felt as though, you know what, I, I can help you there. Sent him some names. He didn't hire any of them. But he did end up with someone. And so I, I say that to this community to know that while he is building something that we all have been looking for, the behind the scenes work that's being done is one in which I think you will find that diversity is part of it. And so I, I just want to say that to me that means a lot. Yeah. What you get done after that is just, that I'm not a part of that. But for here, I just felt that that's something for this meeting that I wanted to bring up. Um, so now we'll get to the tough part. Yeah, no, that means a lot to us too. And it's integral and in not just the part that we're at now, but continuing, you know, through construction, lease up, management, everything else. Questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, Corey. Not bad. I just want to know, um, who are the eight people, and what supermarket? Is it a shop or? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know. That's the million dollar question everybody wants to know. Um, I track all the emails with people's requests for supermarkets. ShopRite's number three on the list. 
Um, I am not at liberty to disclose who the supermarket is at this time. We're under a confidentiality agreement with them. They'll, they'll dictate when we can say who they are. Uh, I think next month I can give you more details. Not a name, but I can give you some, you know, other, uh, uh, I don't know, details about what they do and where they are around the country and everything else. But I'm not at liberty to say the name. Yeah, I, uh, I could recite them off if you want me to, but I'm uh, happy to give you my business card as well. Uh, so Rocco Gennetti, resident of Montclair, uh, grandfather grew up on Pine Street, uh, principal with Gensler. Uh, Ruth Rowe with Datner Architects, uh, Mia Lee with Datner Architects, Bill Stein with Datner Architects, uh, the guys from Arterial, uh, Dave Lesberg and James, former Montclair residents, business still based in Montclair, um, and uh, Alan Horowitz with Baseline Architecture, and I, myself obviously. Uh, was that eight? I haven't been counting. I don't know if I lost anyone. <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome. Are there any questions for Bill Casper? Yes. Do you, have, do you have a commitment to hire people from the community in our construction? Potentially, yeah. Uh, we, we have no reason not to. Um, it's probably the right way to answer that question. I know uh, Councilman and I have talked about that as well. Um, when I had been meeting with Mr. Pelham as well, it was great because the one request that he made, he said, and it was one of the few people that said this, it's private property, you do what you want with it. My only request is, you know, hire minorities and hire women-owned businesses to work on the project, uh, which again, part of our ethos, part of that whole three pillars of sustainability. So certainly, and I think the fact that we have eight members of the community working on the design element alone, um, hopefully reinforces our commitment to engaging local community members. Mr. Scott, and then Jose. Dave, you know I've, I've tracked you down every time you drop your children off at Michigan. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but just could you just elaborate a little bit on the, the real commitment that you're setting for affordable housing and workforce housing? Yeah, uh, way to throw me on the spot with that one. Um, you know, committed to doing not less than 20% affordable housing, and would look to do additional affordable and workforce housing above that kind of minimum threshold for us. So I think doing above and beyond 20% would be one of our goals uh, on this project. And that, that would be a first in Montclair. That's right. There's going to be a lot of firsts in Montclair with this project. Mr. Scott, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll, well, you guys know each other. Yep. Uh, Jose? Yeah. Uh, I'm Jose German, founder of the Northeast Bird Coalition, also a neighbor of Lackawanna Plaza. Yeah. Um, we have a project right there. You uh, do. Grand Park. And we have in mind many years ago to can, can have a corridor, coordinated corridor connecting uh, Glenbridge Avenue to uh, Church Street and then going to uh, Eagle Rock Mountain. Right. And that is part of the uh, connection that we want to complete when the Greenway corridor is connected. That corridor will be connecting, the pollinator corridor will be connected to New York City. Why? Because we are part of a uh, regional uh, pollinator corridor coming from Maine to Virginia. So all of this uh, 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 project will be connected at some point. Montclair is already connected from Alexander Avenue to uh, uh, Bay Street and probably Linfield Park in some way. Uh, but that, uh, whatever you decide to do uh, in the property or in the development, I would like to talk to you about uh, the things that will be very careful yeah. to have your own, your own habitat uh, with native plants and sustainable uh, eco friendly. Yeah, so uh, glad to meet you. Um, Wait, you guys haven't met? We haven't met, but I, I will say that this week I had reached out to a bunch of people to get your contact info, which I got. So you've been on my list of somebody to reach out to and get connected with as well. Um, so it's good to meet you here, and uh, hopefully we can connect next week and talk in more detail. Look, I'm a, a, a fan of native plant species and what they do for the local land and the environment and everything else. Uh, if you want to talk bees with me, I'm happy to. Um, I've got a, a, you know, a lot of desire to incorporate pollinators and continue the work That's that great. you did at Crane Park. I also, enable, uh, I also want to bring a point that uh, Councilor Comey brought that uh, we need to have some kind of communication because 
our community between Warnock Street and Bloomfield Avenue, it has a huge impact in development. And also as a neighbor in the, in the area, you know, we, we see every day everything is going on. One example is every day in the morning, I need to go out of my house before nine o'clock. I need to wake up very early, put my car out there, because it, at 7, 7.30, it's impossible to get out of my home. And we are the same, all the neighbors are experiencing the same, it's the traffic. So knowing there would be more development in the neighborhood, that would be very difficult for us, especially when we have two large senior community in the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Mr. Gill is here. Uh, the county need to do something for the sidewalk in, um, in Grove Street. Uh, people in, in wheelchair, they can't barely move. It's really difficult for them, and I have seen many seniors in wheelchair going to the street because the, 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 the sidewalk in, in Grove Street is destroyed. Where? What part of Grove? Are you talking by like Between, Ghana or uh, between Claremont? Grove Pharmacy and... Oh, so yeah. Grove, okay, so the whole car. Yeah, the whole Okay, you're, so you're talking about this, the... The, the high course. concentration of senior people okay. in there. Yeah. All right. What I will say, um, Jose, I appreciate yeah. that, is that, um, yes, you guys should definitely get together and talk in more detail. Um, because I think where your park is located um, is probably one of the, is, you have a neighbor there who's probably maybe one of the most difficult persons to deal with in regards to this development. I'm not going to say names, but I'm just saying that. So <laughs> that's going to be something that, um, but then to your point about parking, as Janice knows, and the iterations that we've been working with, David, that is something that has been discussed. And what we do come up with will, well, I don't know if it will satisfy everybody, but you, you jargon, you, you, you jargon some. The owner of 10 Elm Street, who will be doing the development there, he's out of the country. He agreed to come tonight, but he's out of the country. So next month, he will get a chance to come and speak to everyone about what he plans on doing there. Uh, and I, um, so I appreciate your words because you jogged that memory. You can't go nowhere I'm soon, man. You, you got to, you um, but David, uh, thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, Thanks, everybody. Yeah. And uh, anybody celebrating the holiday, I'll see you at all the bars. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, the last part we're going to talk about is um, I put down rent control, rent referendum, and really voter turnout because I think they're both connected. And so, what I want to do, uh, Mr. Scott, are you willing or able to come up and provide anything um, after Mr. Burr explains what the township passed last night? And I ask that out of respect if you want to. I'll let Mr. Burr go first. Okay. So as you all know, last night, we, the council, essentially put forth a ref put forth the opportunity to, to go towards a referendum. And the petitioners, as well as the folks for rent control, have 10 days to work out an agreement to potentially bring rent control to Montclair. So that's kind of where we are, but do you want to give the process, Mr. Burr? Yes, sure. Just Paul Burr, our intern attorney, Thanks. who last night we extended for the rest of the year based on the work that he's been doing the last three months since he replaced our former town attorney. Mr. Burr, you can and, up over here. And also, a, I speak pretty loud. But I'll well, he needs mic. you on the mic. <laughs> and he did not, he thanked every council last night for his um, extension, except me. And I literally lived next door to him. So when he came home, his fence had a hole in it. <laughs> well, that would be your fence, too. But, <laughs> but yeah. Well, uh, and Mr. Cummings, uh, and I do want to thank you for all of your support of me, uh, throughout, not just throughout the uh, time that I have become interim township attorney, but throughout the years that we have known each other. Uh, David and I go back. We're both Montclair born and bred uh, and generational uh, Montclairians. I'm also, just to, for everyone's knowledge, I'm also a fourth ward resident. So 
Uh, it's nice to meet everybody here. Fortunately, I grew up in the second ward. Um, but I'm now in the fourth ward. So with that being said, uh, last night, um, as everyone is aware, we certified the petition for, for a referendum. And what that petition was was a challenge by um, five indi individuals in the town who uh, objected to the rent control ordinance that was passed in 2020 by Mr. Cummings' predecessor uh, council, which uh, Dr. Baskerville was a part of. They finally got worked through, and I can't talk too much about the details, but we worked through getting that, th that petition certified. So next steps are the council, well, I should say, what happened last night was the council uh, adopted a resolution to direct the township clerk to set up a special election for the referendum. Before that can happen, though, the petitioners have a 10-day right to withdraw their petition, uh, which is a request to the council to repeal the ordinance. During that period of time, whatever happens between the two parties that are negotiating uh, and talking behind the scenes, which does not involve the council's involvement or the township's involvement at this time, we'll see whether they come up with a um, agreeable, uh, amendable uh, ordinance that can be adopted by the council. But if that should not happen, then after their 10 days has expired to withdraw their petition within 40 days and no more than 60 days, the township has to have a, an election on the referendum. And so those are the next steps. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Why Swartz. Isn't the council directly involved in the I cannot given, dis given that it's a council law that was opposed by a party, why is the council allowing, maybe David, you want to answer this, why is the council allowing the parties to operate independently without any direct input in the negotiations itself? Well, let me, let me, ask, let me answer that, David, because that is a topic of litigation. Right, that's a topic that we're in litigation, and the council's been directed not to respond to questions like that. And it's, you know, because I did as township council. So we're not going to, you know, it's because it's in litigation, anything Mr. Cummings or any of the other councilors, including the mayor, can, would say may wind up uh, in part of that. Those conversations or those comments may, be, may wind up in part of the lit litigation. So with that being said, we will not be commenting on any specifics relating to the litigation and any discussions of, of uh, settlement. I'm so glad you came to you're most welcome. Okay. And that's why you asked me to come to the meeting. Right. I have to follow up. I want to give everybody an opportunity to ask questions. Does, hold on, Martin, hold on. Does anyone else have a question? No one else? Okay, Martin. Isn't that a recipe for continuing the conflict rather than attempting to resolve it? Well, there are discussions that go on behind the scenes between, count, between the council for the township and the council for the petitioners. And that's where those conversations take place, and that's where those conversations, at least at this point in time, will remain confidential at, between the parties. Any, any other further questions? And so I was just here to give you the update on what the process is, what the law is on a referendum. Uh, petition. So uh, you were here to keep me out of the bus. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> You're most welcome. Um, Thank you. Scott, did you have anything to say? Well, I would say at this point, since there is an opportunity to come up with a possible agreement between the petitioners and the supporters of rent control in this township, uh, we are within, or we are. Immediately, matter of fact, we immediately went into negotiations, and we want to meet that deadline, if possible. Uh, I'm not going to disclose any 
negotiation yeah. tactics at this time, or whatever the case might be. Uh, but we have been involved in the process. Uh, the principals from the Property Owners Association wanted to work with the supporters of rent control. Uh, it's obvious it's been in the newspaper, so you know who the parties are uh, that are involved in that negotiation. And um, I would say the, the representation uh, within that process, and also myself being a landlord, uh, uh, I think we're, we're trying to move in the right direction. Thank you. Um, Mr. Genova, you want to say anything? I want to uh, say that because I gave Mr. Scott yeah, a chance. No, to, I appreciate it. You guys um, I, I echo what, what William said, what Mr. Scott said. Uh, we've been in, in negotiations with, uh, with both sides and uh, making progress. I hope, hope to make more progress. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, I want to share with you an experience um, that I have this week. This is a family in the Fort Worth. They got a rent increase, $400 extra per month during the moratorium. Number one, this family is not is now not able to meet the basic because they need to keep the home for the children. And that is the kind of things that we need to think about. There is a lot of people silent out there, you know, struggling to, to remain in town and we don't know everything is going on. We were able to provide them food and we will be providing them food every week. But I, I want to bring tonight this incident because it's not only an isolated case. There is many. So we need to find a solution. And I, I, we, we do receive emails. And so I think to your point, there are um, discussions in there. If you have their name, please send that to me. I got it call today for someone who um, <clears throat> has had a bathroom for five months. And so I've got to talk to, I told him send me your name and then we're going to look into that. So when you find things like that, please, Deirdre's very good about that. Yes, Mr. Scott. And Mr. Farr, you may also want to mention the fact that the council did approve uh, a rent moratorium extension, freeze extension uh, for another Three months. Uh, so well, that, just, that was very important. That that uh, yes, occur. that was passed. Us. And there was tremendous support uh, amongst several community organizations. Obviously, you're aware of the letter we sent from the NAACP, different clergy organizations that supported that. Uh, but uh, I think the council, uh, and this is my opinion, I'm free to give this, uh, just to uh, Mr. Gorman's uh, point. You know, we've got to have some protection. Uh, now, we obviously, we have to enforce that moratorium. That's another critical piece that we really have to take a look at. But right now, until we have rent control, we've got to have some protection in place. Uh, so, just speaking personally, okay, I know we're in the midst of negotiation, but we're trying to work through this issue to come up with a rent control ordinance for this township. Dude, Dude. Um, so I am presently the chairperson of the Landlord Tenant Advisory Committee, and what is, should be happening is there is a space on the township website for residents to go to. You can go to the search bar and type Landlord Tenant, and then there should be information to lead them to the website. There's a telephone number that they can call. I'll provide that later. And what happens is, is we speak to them, and we sometimes speak with the landlord as well. Unfortunately, there's a lot of landlords in town that are not aware about this rent control issue or the rent freeze moratorium. And they are really taking advantage of tenants who may not be informed. So I'm asking everybody in this room, if you are aware of any tenant in the situation or any landlord, please share that there is help available. We provide information, resources. Um, we're waiting for some additional things to happen. Um, in terms of, of additional members, but you know, we, we've been able to, um, well, I can't say that word, work with, work with, <laughs> work with. Right. and we've been very successful. 
Uh, and so I, I have other resources that I can share from the state and other levels as well. So um, it's unfortunate that that happened, but you know maybe we can connect that as well. And they do, you know, do contact the council company. And this dovetails into what I consider the most important thing, and that's voting turnout. Um, the most recent referendum where we had roughly 4,000 people turn out to vote. Uh -huh. And of that 4,000, <laughs> roughly 2,600 came from one district, one more collaboration. We were talking earlier about districts. 1,000 people from the fourth ward voted. So I think um, this is an area that we really, really need to look into. And that's why Mr. Scott has some, um, do you, have the, do, you have, do you have ballots over there, or do you have the yes, vote? He has ballots as well as voter registration. That's why Dr. Baskerville <laughs> is in the midst of leading a voter registration drive and also voter turnout opportunity to get people to understand that if we do have an election, which potentially may be May 10th, if we do have an election, we need to turn out. Um, and, and I say that not just for this election, all elections, but the last election truly reflected that if you don't turn out, you don't know what you're going to get. In this case, you will know what you're going to get or what you may not get. So I think it's incumbent on people uh, to really rally just to get people to turn out so that we have a, a whatever the result is, we know that the people had a say. And so um, I think that's very, very important. And that's why I said I wanted to say that last. And I know over the next couple of weeks, months, there will be a lot of discussion and a lot of outreach in neighborhoods to make sure, A, that as Deirdre said, people are aware of the rent moratorium and the opportunities around it. B, that they're aware that an election will be coming up, referendum will be coming up. And C, how to register to vote if they're not registered to vote and how to use a mail-in ballot. So those are some of the platforms that will be discussed. Um, I want to personally thank you. I said 9 o'clock, it's 9 2. So we kind of got there. Um, but I would be totally, totally remiss if I did not thank some people, which would be Dr. Baskerville, Mr. Scott, Deirdre Malloy, Jasmine Johnson in the back, and Amina Toller, and Ms. Nick. These individuals, we meet with me every Saturday. We do a Zoom call, and they keep me, they, they basically tell me, okay, you're not doing this, or you're doing that, but they keep me informed. That must be a long meeting. <laughs> <laughs> they keep me informed, and I think it's important that, you know, the community, because I can't be everywhere, but with this group, um, I have an opportunity to hear and they educate me. They give me things that I need to know about and talk about and support. So I think, I just, I just want you all to know publicly how much I appreciate that. And I also want to tell you, when the agenda's not late, when the agenda's not on time, there's normally like a 5.50 a.m. email from Dr. Baskerville, <laughs> capitalized <laughs> letters, hey, you know, I have a plan today, what time are we meeting? This right here, so understand it's all in love. Um, and so I think it's very important that you all know that the next meeting, I have committed to doing this monthly um, because I think it's very important that no matter what's going on, we continue to meet, dialogue, and talk. I don't know what the next conversation is going to be about. I hope not to repeat, repeat, repeat. But it's very important that you know that we will be available to you and we'll be here to talk and hear what you have to say and give you an opportunity. Yes, Mr. Scott. And in, in transparency, I can jump Dave Spence to get to him, <laughs> and I can walk through Mr. Barr's bushes to get to him. Right. <laughs> so we, I, 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 we, we stay on guard, too. <laughs> <laughs> we, keep Mr. we keep Mr. Scott happy. I steal a lot of wood from my neighbors. All right? I'm just letting you know. I keep a barbecue going. I steal wood. But uh, no, seriously. And Rick, I want to thank you. Uh, this will be the meeting. This will show up on the 34 tomorrow. You guys understand, Rick is the guy responsible for our council meetings being aired, our planning more being aired. Anything you see on TV 34, Rick is there. He was down at the um, Wally Choice, not Wally Choice, well, he is down at Wally Choice for an event. He was also at the Catching Owen Suite. So, Rick is somebody. 
you don't know how much I appreciate you and others for the fact that when we ask, he comes and he does a great job. So thank you so much, Rick. Janice was very responsible for Sonya showing up tonight because, you know, as we, there are things that happen. Jen, this is the really the person who runs my way. <laughs> Just what you know. Um, but no, she was, I asked her, she said, hey, David, I'll get her there. To, sorry she didn't have the presentation about 399 Orange Road, but Janice is someone to reach out to because of my Saturday. The reason I'm reaching out to you more is because of Saturday morning meeting. Because it's called Janice. Even the same Janice is question. And so I really appreciate you being here as well. Um, and so thank you again, everybody. Um, look forward to next month. It will not be on a Wednesday because as I see Pastor Campbell here in the black community and every community, Wednesday is Bible study. So we will not be meeting on Wednesday evenings anymore because I think it's important that the pastor can be here. Um, pastor Campbell is a staunch supporter of the fourth board in Mount Blair. Thank you so much. I hope you made it. All right, David, I'll see you tomorrow. All right. Uh, <laughs>